Hi everyone, welcome to the channel, welcome to our Bible study, welcome to 2 Kings chapter 19. If you were with us yesterday, this is a continuation of what we talked about in chapter 18. The Assyrians have come against the city of Jerusalem, they've threatened it, they've mocked God. Now what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem and King Hezekiah, and how is God going to respond to the Assyrian threat? Historically speaking, these events probably fit between the years of 730 to 695 BC. That's a round number for the reign of King Hezekiah. He reigned for 29 years in Judah. We've got our expanded map today, and that's because we need to talk about the city of Nineveh. That's where the king of Assyria was from. You'll see Nineveh over there along the Tigris River up towards the, the top of the map. Now, he's away from Nineveh. He's down threatening the city of Jerusalem, which is over there by the Mediterranean Sea. That's where we've been for most of the Bible so far. Now, who are the key players in this chapter? Who are the key characters? First, we have Hezekiah, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. Then we have Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. And then the Rabshakeh. We talked about this guy in the last chapter. The Rabshakeh is probably a title for an Assyrian military officer. And he was used by the king of Assyria to threaten, basically to deliver the threats against the city. And then we have Isaiah. Now, maybe you've heard about him before. There's actually a book in the Bible named Isaiah written by this guy. Uh, he was a prophet of God and the author of the book of Isaiah. And we'll return to him and... it. It, try to understand a little bit better how he fits into this whole story and how his book fits into this whole story for our application section. Isaiah is going to make a quick appearance in chapter 19 in verses 1 through 7. Hezekiah seeks the advice of the prophet Isaiah. So in chapter 18, as we talked about, the Assyrians have come and threatened the city of Jerusalem and King Hezekiah. And after hearing these threats, Hezekiah sends for Isaiah. He wants his advice. He wants his counsel. Isaiah sent back an encouraging message saying that the Lord was going to deliver the city of Jerusalem. He was going to strike the king of Assyria. And after hearing a rumor, the king of Assyria would return home. So the city of Jerusalem would be saved. God's deliverance hasn't come yet, though. So in verses 8 through 13, the king of Assyria sends more threats against Jerusalem. The king of Assyria was informed that the king of Cush which most scholars think was down in Africa, like Ethiopia, is not on the map. You know, the map can only get so big. <laughs> we have to fit more information than just a map on there. But uh, down, down in Africa, which would be south of Egypt, the king of Cush was coming against the king of Assyria to fight with him. So in an attempt to get Jerusalem just to surrender quickly, he sent more threats to Hezekiah. His words mocked the God of Jerusalem, just as they had in the last chapter, and they compared the God of Jerusalem to all the false gods of the foreign nations that the Assyrians had already conquered. Now, God's not really going to be too happy about this, and that's part of the reason that he humbles the Assyrians and he saves Jerusalem. Verses 14 through 19, Hezekiah's prayer. So Hezekiah took this written letter, these threats that the king of Assyria had delivered, he took them to the temple and he spread them out before the Lord. And he prayed that the Lord would deliver Jerusalem for the glory of his name so that all nations would know that the God of Judah was the true God of heaven. In verses 20 through 34, we hear God's response to the proud Assyrians. God sent his response through Isaiah, his prophet. God had not been deaf to the disrespectful words and the blasphemy of the king of Assyria and his servants, and God was going to humble those who disrespected the, quote, Holy One of Israel. God said that although the king of Assyria didn't realize it, it was actually God who permitted him to be a powerful man, and God could take his power away from him whenever he wanted. God was not going to tolerate the king's pride, and he intended to humble him. God uses some really interesting language in this chapter. God said that he was going to put a hook in the king's nose and a bit in his mouth, like a bit that goes into a horse's mouth, and lead him away from Jerusalem. Now, why this language? Well, God probably uses this language because the Assyrians had a habit of doing this very thing to their captives. They were very brutal people, and often when they captured a city or a town and they took captives, they would put a hook through their lip or a ring through their nose, kind of like you do on, you see on a bull, and that allowed them to put a chain and attach it to that hook or to that ring, and basically to lead their captives around like, like animals. And so God was threatening the king of Assyria with the same punishment that he had a habit of inflicting on other people. 
God decreed that the king of Assyria would never enter Jerusalem. He would not even lay siege to the city. He wouldn't even fire an arrow against the city. God was going to save the city for the glory of his name. And then in incredibly brief fashion, in verses 35 through 37, God strikes down the Assyrian army and Sennacherib. So that night, God sent an angel into the camp of the Assyrians, and the angel killed 185,000 people which is an incredible amount of people. And if you wondered what the angel with the sword in the background of our outline is, where that picture comes from, now you finally know it comes from this story in 2 Kings chapter 19. So the king of Syria, after this humbling defeat, returned to Nineveh, and he was actually assassinated by his own sons when he was worshiping in the temple of his false god named Nisroch. And so that is 2 Kings chapter 19. That's how God saved Hezekiah in Jerusalem. It's how he humbled the king of Assyria, very reminiscent of how he humbled the king of Egypt, who thought too much of himself and forgot that God had the power to take him out whenever he wanted. So I've once again changed our application section to an understanding the Bible section to help us with our comprehension of the the whole Bible. 2 Kings 19 contains the very first reference to the prophet Isaiah. Now, as I mentioned, he wrote a book, but that book is typically positioned towards like the middle to the end of the Old Testament in in most Bibles. Now, as we pointed out before, when you buy a typical Bible, not all of the books of the Bible are in chronological order, and some books only give you partial information about certain characters, and you have to go get other information from other books. And that's the case with Isaiah. So we see here the first appearance of Isaiah is during the reign of Hezekiah. But actually, we find out from the book of Isaiah that Isaiah had been a prophet in Judah for quite some time during the reign of many previous kings. In the first verse of the book of Isaiah, it reads like this. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. We've already talked about Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz. They were kings who came before Hezekiah, right? So Isaiah has been around for quite some time, but you only know that if you go back, if you go and, and read the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah wrote about events that occurred in Judah during the 700s BC or so. It's important to keep this in mind when you're trying to piece together the Bible story, because if you're not careful, you go to Isaiah and you think that he's living like, you know, sometime in the future, but really he's living back during the time of these kings. And so that's just one thing to keep in mind. That's That will help you to understand a little bit about where Isaiah fits. And, you know, when you read his book, which is quite an incredible book, you know, all the events that he's describing, or many of them at least, are, are occurring during the days of these kings. 